These videos are about regular people talking about the things that divide us, immigration, race, Trump, etc., so they might offend you. But I hope they're useful like some videos I made about home repairs that helped thousands of people. You see, I hate doing my own home repairs, and I think people like it when you just try to get the job done, without all the special tools, without wasting half your weekend. I don't want to listen to a professional home repair guy who makes it look easy. TV pundits give me the same vibe. I don't want to listen to these people. They have better jobs than regular folks, a TV show or a tenured position or at some nonprofit. And when you see them on TV, they're at work. It's their job to talk about this stuff. They're not really interested in learning from each other and fixing the problem. They sure don't ask the questions I would ask. So me and my brother, who regards himself as progressive, we drove to 22 cities and interviewed dozens of people who support progressive causes. And I learned this. It's our feelings that divide us. Feelings driven by personality. See, some of us want to be the innovators, the trusting, the idealists. We feel strongly about this. And some of us want to be the managers, the cautious, the realists. We also feel strongly about this. And each of us builds a fortress around our feelings that you can't break through with facts and arguments. But maybe we shouldn't try. Apparently, evolution or God or whatever made us this way for a purpose. I think that purpose is that we need each other to get the full picture. I know it works that way with other things, but we have to talk to each other. If we don't talk to each other, we won't make progress. From Eugene, we drove to Ashland, Oregon, where we talked to Van Kraft, a journalist, artist, and writer who's been honored with some of broadcasting's most prestigious awards. His career includes roles as news producer and anchor at KOGO San Diego and news director for Thousand Oaks-based NPR affiliate KCLU. We asked first about his transition to life as an internationally exhibited artist. An artist is a self-appointed position. I enjoy it. I can't stop doing it. So I painted for myself for five years and saw what happened. Things got good. I started to develop and um, I started taking my stuff down. And I was way overconfident. I've always been, in broadcasting, you have to be overconfident. It just goes with the deal. And if you make mistakes, you have to be fine with that. And so that's what I did with painting. I was roaring down to L.A. with, with these modestly good paintings, sort of with a bad case of look what I did. So you were selling your work? Is I was saying? not selling anything. Oh, okay. But I thought I would. And just to be performing and going down to L.A. and, and self-appointed as an artist was right then, was enough. And I was able to carry that through. Okay. Now, I remember read, reading on her website that you were saying, hey, I, I, used to, I tell stories. I used to tell stories on radio. I do it That's now right. with my, picture, my paintings. What story do you think needs to be told right now? I think that we have a hard time looking at who we really are and what we're actually doing that there's a lot of noise going on and there's a lot of distraction. And for people to go to a Thanksgiving, for instance, in a family and just sit and be quiet is unthinkable. There has to be all of the gadfly talk, all of the usual suspects and everything. If they actually sat and looked quietly, like Kafka says, in silence and saw what they're really doing, they'd probably have heart attacks. They might not be very happy. Mm -hmm. So we kind of disguise that. So my, my, objective in painting was to show at the best of my ability who we really are and what we're actually doing. Okay. And if that res resonates with somebody, then that's a success. I think this is just fascinating what's happening in this country. There's a renewed interest in nationalism and national well-being as opposed to global well-being mm -hmm. as evidenced by the Trump election. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's a good thing? No. If a country had something specific to offer, I'd say yes. Let me go back a little bit. When, when I was working in broadcasting, they had a guy named Osama bin Laden who blew up the American embassy somewhere in Africa. And they were saying, he's a terrible man. He's a bad man. And it was almost like 1984. I, I said, well, who is it? What did he want? I mean, people don't go to that link to blow up something and risk all of that without a purpose. And yet nobody in my profession that I saw was, was saying, why did he do it? Who actually was he? And so I called the, the social sciences guy and asked him, what was his take on this? He said, well, you know, it's a lot like uh, the elephant in bed with the mouse. The elephant rolls over and squeezes the mouse. The mouse doesn't like it and bites him. The elephant doesn't think it did anything wrong, but the mouse doesn't like it and didn't think it did anything wrong to get squeezed. And he said that was kind of our foreign policy. Okay. And at the time, just to provide context, you were in the news business yourself, right? Right. right. Okay. So it, this isn't just you talking to some Joe on the street. Right. Okay. I was, and I used it in the story, and I didn't see any other stories 
that really now obviously maybe the Christian Science Monitor or some higher end publications like that had that, but I didn't. I wasn't privy to anything that really went into depth about that. Yeah. And I think we need to do that. So to answer your question, if the nationalism is simply the knee jerk reaction to he's a bad man, then I'm against it. Okay. What do you think about the, I guess the economic nationalism, the idea that a government should be out for the well-being of its citizenry first and foremost. I agree with that completely, and I'll tell you why. I was, I was at the Los Angeles County Festival of Books uh, during the Bush administration, and I'd never really been privy to the uh, first time I ever went, and I'd never seen panels at the level of these guys before, uh, and talking about things that I'd never really thought about or heard before. And they had a, a captain in the army, and he said. Most of the things that we fight for overseas, we fight for the freedom to acquire material abundance. So we're not really fighting for freedom of speech. We're not fighting for any of the other founding fathers' ideas. We're basically fighting for material assets and the freedom to assess those. I like having those things. I do feel guilty that we're taking them at the expense of other countries and other populations. And maybe that's why there's all that blowback. Okay, yeah. That's such a practical way. Because, yeah, I mean, because it's funny because I've, I've asked other folks that question. And I always have to, when they, when they disagree, because they always disagree. So, no, 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 I don't think we should be out for ourselves. I said, well, there's other countries are out for themselves. Sure, they are. Oh, okay. So yeah. you would agree with that. Okay, I would great. agree with that. But I just, I would also, I would say that it's very hypocritical to say, well, we're, the, the troops that are supporting fighting for our freedom. Mm -hmm. They're only fighting for our freedom to get stuff. Okay. Okay. In my opinion. Okay. Um, Try saying you don't support the troops sometimes. Put that bumper sticker on your car and see what happens to you. <laughs> Would you be in favor then of um, an economic system that was, say, less like capitalism, more of a share the wealth kind of a system like socialism or communism? I would, I would say that capitalism has to be regulated. Everybody's always said that. And that uh, a socialist society... I, the problem with socialism is that there are some bad stories. One particular story, uh, a colleague of mine was doing something on um, on limited assets for, for, for the indigent. And uh, they had a woman being interviewed, and she had five children, no husband, various, I suppose, fathers. And she'd never had anything but a, but a minimum wage job. And she was angry that they were cutting child care for her five children. There has to be some accountability. Okay. So if you can connect accountability with sharing the wealth, then I'm all for it. Do you think that income inequality is a problem in this country? Yeah, I do. Okay. I mean, how so? What's the, what's the problem with somebody making a tremendous amount versus somebody who's making nothing at all? Nothing. I mean, I've heard that one of the answers to... Job security is make yourself indispensable. Mm -hmm. But then how do 200 people become indispensable in one operation? Mm -hmm. That's the dilemma, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that Judge Judy makes about 10 times more than the Supreme Court justice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why is that? Yeah. What would be your solution to income inequality? Is, it, is this something that requires a solution? Or there's even a practical well, solution? In England, they would tax you 110%, I think. I was over in Monaco at an AA meeting, and I ran into a guy named uh, Richard Starkey. And I said, why are you there? He said, my name's Ringo. And I had to get citizenship here because they were charging me so many taxes, I literally couldn't live. And I was a rich guy. You know, he didn't really mean he couldn't live, but he they were killing him. And he was an extreme example. So... I think, I think the Beatles that, wrote a song about that. <laughs> right. I think that, that uh, and that's in a socialist country. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know the answer. What do you think of, I mean, uh, so many of the folks I've talked to on this tour have become politically active for the first time uh, after the Trump victory. Um, what, in your opinion, is, is just so maddening or so frustrating to... Uh, I guess hypocrisy. Okay. I explain that if you could. When you say something's black <clears throat> and then you say it's white the next day, people sort of question that. And, then, and if, you're, if your motive is purely self-interest and self-aggrandizement, 
then I would say that there's a flaw in character, or at least a different kind of character that I'd be comfortable with. I would uh, not work for somebody that that had, uh, what would you call it, um, mercenary uh, ideology that that placed themselves sort of at a higher level of, uh, I'm not explaining it very well. No, 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 I, you, I, you, I read you loud and clear. And I agree wholeheartedly with Trump. He's a blunt instrument, but the thing if, to Trump supporters is he's our blunt instrument. He, he, he thinks other people don't understand that he is going to help them. I mean, when he did the outreach to the African-American community, it was just touching because it was like, guys, don't you understand? I'm your friend. I'm the one that's going to do this for you. And you know he didn't get much didn't get much traction with that, but that's I believe that's what he believes. I believe he really thinks he's going to fix the economy. Every town has somebody they love to hate. And you're right. He's definitely put himself in that position by his own hand. Yeah. So when you ponder about the people who voted for Trump, what do you think? Where do you think they're coming from? I have good friends that that are voted for Trump and. and most of it simply because Hillary Clinton was was you know an idiotic candidate in my opinion it was her turn I mean I'm pretty good at watching delivery it's my business or was and she had this screeching howl with bug eyes she could have lost a little weight I mean come on just a little bit if you're gonna be in the public eye that much and all of these things combined in, in, the, in her persona was just so un, un, just distasteful that I probably never missed an Obama speech in the sense that I liked the comment, I liked his delivery, he was charismatic, Kennedy, the whole deal. Even Johnson was good. But I never watched a Hillary Clinton uh, speech, I don't think, more than, the two, uh, than 30 seconds. <laughs> and yet I voted for her because I believed in the ideals that she had as opposed to the ideals that Trump had. It's just so refreshing to hear somebody talk so, so it's such so candor. So here's here's one thing that conservatives, I think, um, come back to over and over again when when we hear about things that are in the offing, like maybe universal health care or a living wage. From the 40s to the 70s, all the best experts thought the solution for urban renewal was to build these giant high-rise apartments in the yeah. cities where we would put people who needed housing. Right. And you know, what a horrific debacle that turned into. They're all being torn down. Nobody defends them anymore. And this was typical, you know, government, instead of measure twice, cut once, they didn't measure at all. They just went with something that sounded good, mm -hmm. right? So whether it's the projects, kind of urban renewal, or whether it's that gosh darn food pyramid from the 70s that I, <laughs> I tried to follow for That's 30 right. years and got heavier and heavier Meat every year. three times a day. Cured meats, too. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, but, you know, conservatives are so skeptical of these big projects because we've seen what horrific conse unintended consequences yeah. they can have. Yeah. So don't these kind of well-intentioned policy debacles just give you pause when you think about things like causes that progressives think are near and dear now? Sure. But health care... I did a series for three years on healthcare for, 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 actually for NPR, the head office. And, um, the argument that I was hearing a lot, I was going to visit a couple people in my area who were head, heads of hospitals. Mm -hmm. And they said, I said, well, what about, uh, Ireland or what about other countries where you have to wait in long lines? You don't have the, uh, all, have the ac access to all of the, uh, facilities that, that they have. He says, we've got, eight times the facilities of Canada. We've got the staff, we've got the equipment. That's not the same thing. It's a different country. We have, this is the United States of America. We've got MRIs, we've got everything you could possibly want. We have, and people, plenty of access to them. But there is a corporate interest involved in this, unfortunately, in this decision, and they're not going to let go, kicking and screaming. Where is the generation of this idea that, um, well, there is a history to how uh, the government has required hospitals to care for everyone. And that's care. right. That's the that's the Jimmy and the monkey. In there. Yes. Okay. What do you think about that? Is that the genesis of our problems? Yes. 
Okay. If you if you have to, you can't have one without the other. If you if hospitals are required to treat people, then the middle class is going to pay for it. I haven't heard anyone say that so matter of factly. But you're right. That's I think that's the irresistible. That's the you know the force of nature that will not let us come up with a a simple solution. Well, the simple solution would <laughs> would be to, to make the, make the payments more equitable, spread them out a little bit. Okay. Are you talking then about a universal health care? Yeah. Okay. And the only reason that, that, as far as I know, there one big reason that, that universal health care could be doomed is because of the health of the Ameri average American citizen. They didn't take that into consideration. We're an extraordinarily unhealthy population. Okay. And and the objection, I mean, what about the uh, the situations that we see where folks that do have the money that can afford it will come to America for um, for medical coverage because of the long wait times that you find in places like England and Canada. Again, back to the same question that, that we have more machines and equipment here. Okay. So it sounds like what you're saying is, hey, we can do this and pro we could probably do it better than anybody else. So maybe it's time to try universal health care. It looks that, that way. Okay. It looks that way. Okay. I mean, good. why give all the money to the pharmaceutical companies? Yeah. Do you love them? No, no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> they don't love you. I'd like to buy health insurance the same way I can buy electronics on Amazon. I want there to be competition everywhere. Are are there defenses for not selling health insurance across state lines? Only because this, a lot of states have decided that this that some insurance policies in some states are inadequate. Okay. That's funny because that sounds like a states' rights issue, and usually conservatives are very big on states' I rights. I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> okay. I like see. states' rights, except that when it's tyranny of the majority, when a population can humiliate or defeat somebody or, or compromise somebody just based on a unanimous vote. Mm -hmm. And that's when you'd think that the, that the local government, the state government would intercede, but a lot of times they don't because it's not popular. They have conflicts of interest. I guess then, from your point of view, the uh, state's rights... It's it a mixed sound, bag. It sounds like it can be dangerous. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and the thing you fear is the, the tyranny of the majority. Right. Okay, the simple majority. You could vote somebody's rights away right. and get away with it in a state, okay. whereas the federal government says, wait a minute, there's a constitution that says you can't do that to somebody. Okay. What we're seeing now, of course, is uh, conservatives being the ones who are on the losing end of that because cities and states are, th are talking about becoming sanctuaries. And yeah. now all of a sudden we're not into states' rights. Right. Yeah. That's true. That seems stunningly, uh, you know. Marijuana yeah. is still a federal crime. Yeah. And yet a lot of states have legalized it. Yeah. <laughs> but if the feds wanted to do it, they could bust them. Okay. Here's a question I've been dying to ask someone who, you know, supports progressive causes. Do you think that all cultures are equally praiseworthy? All cultures are equally praiseworthy? Hell no. Right. Okay. No. Okay. I don't know very many that are praiseworthy. <laughs> <laughs> what name one that's praiseworthy? <laughs> You remember when uh, we were saying, "Well, we're going to bring you know, we're going to bring more of American culture to uh, Iraq or something oh, like God, that." Oh yeah. And some people were like, "Exactly which part was it? The unwed mother <laughs> rate was it? The, yeah. the opioid addiction? Exactly what?" <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, hand in hand with that, to me, then is we do have a huge amount of uh, folks that are coming into the uh, the U.S. who are coming from different cultures, right. and in the past. Assimilation has been kind of the name of the game. That's how we did things in America. Right. Now that we're bringing in folks that are coming from from uh, emerging nations, third world countries, um, is it a legitimate fear for American citizens to say, well, that's that's something I really don't want to see in this, that, that part of their culture? Ben Franklin said way back, that his biggest fear, one of his biggest fears, was that America becomes America becomes a boarding house for the third world. Uh, so you wouldn't care necessarily characterize. You haven't characterized Trump voters as racist, like you know some some knee jerk. Uh, oh, racist is, to me is silly. I grew up a lot in the South. A lot. I've seen racism. I've seen it gentle, and I've seen it crude. Uh -huh. And they say the first three things people notice about somebody are their age their gender and their race. And that's all it is, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So it's, it's uh, what kills me is that you know I'm I'm sick I'm a Trump supporter I'm sick of being called a racist and a fascist and uh, <laughs> uh, and I don't understand why people don't understand that it's a legitimate fear to that you know that we I mean, for for our whole history we've tried to balance All assimilation. Right. I'll let me put it this way then: race isn't the issue itself. Race is a, a byproduct. Or, or maybe even identif identification. In other words, in my opinion, at least, being in the South, blacks, the fact that they were the Negro race was irrelevant, was, was just a coincidence. It was the fact that, that they were slaves, that they were subjugated, and that they were more or less beaten into this sort of subservient, illiterate person or, char or, or characterization or, or community where people didn't want anything to do with them. And, and the only way they identified them was that they were black. They could have been any any race. So the racial part, racial part, is just was a means of identifying. And I think the same with the third world. Uh, we say it's racist, and because first of all, you're not going to stop human osmosis. You may try, but you won't. Eventually, human osmosis is going to going to continue. And so you can either be graceful about it, or you can fight it. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's a valid fear, though, that you should put throttles on that osmosis, uh, you know, because you have a valid fear that it lowers things, your standards? Yes, that it um, that it changes the American nature. You know, Thomas Jefferson had such high hopes that the best, the brightest of humanity would come here because it doesn't matter who your daddy was or you know. I think how many that's our job are. here. I knew some some Asian some Cambodian students that worked for me down in Thousand Oaks at my house. They were the two young girls, and they were college age. And there was a, 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 a guy down in L.A. in Little Saigon who put up a, uh, I guess, a North Vietnamese flag in his window. He was a merchant. And they're all up in arms about it. The community was out protesting in front of his thing. And I said, well, look, it's a, you know, you have a freedom of speech. And they go, Yes, but it was a bad place. It was a bad flag. It was a bad thing. In other words, they didn't even understand the simplest concept of a democracy in, in our, our, our ideals and standards. And I don't blame letting them in. I blame what we do with them when they get here. Okay. Yeah. Our education system is, is a joke. Okay. It's our fault. See, they were in college. Wow. And they Why didn't... didn't somebody in public education teach them any better than that? It's not their fault. That's a good point. And that segues into a discussion of what do you think of the protesters that you see nowadays, which we haven't seen before, where we see both, you know, we see folks with Nazi symbols and tiki tortures, and then we also see people with these masks and sticks yeah. and shutting down speakers. I think the people themselves, you have to look at the people themselves. They just have a bee in their bonnet. They're angry and they want to argue about something. I... I, I used to run talk radio shows when I worked at a conservative station. And the guys that called up, you could have flipped things sideways and it wouldn't have mattered. They just wanted, they were un unhappy, they felt marginalized, and they wanted to, to rant. So they were angry guys. The cause was irrelevant. Okay. And I think the cause on both sides probably is irrelevant. So Antifa, that would be your characteristics of, an, of Antifa. It's just, you know, folks that just want to get it off their chest, more or less. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, great. Very reasonable way to describe it. So I, I think personally that immigration is what decided the, uh, the election. It was people's concern about immigration. How? I think people are afraid. Uh, people in building trades, you know, you can get guys to hang drywall for $5 an hour yeah. because it doesn't require much skills. Right. Uh, where I am in Phoenix, I mean, uh, you know, folks, you, you try to get a job and they said, you speak Spanish. Ah. So it's, it's, a new, it's a new reality for folks that are American citizens. And we feel in a way betrayed by... The government because they did this bizarre experiment where you know they ended the Bracero program from from the 40s right because yeah. Bracero program to try to save agribusiness from going to Mexico right so they end the Bracero program and then they have this fantasy where we're just going to let people keep crossing even though we ended the Bracero program we're just going to let people keep well, how crossing about anchor it. babies oh yeah we're yeah. the only industrialized nation that allows that right so it's a huge issue and to me it's an issue that. Um, that's why I think I think Trump won the election because it's this amazing low-hanging fruit that nobody was willing to, you know, nobody had ever said in political speech in the last thirty years, "Hey, this is uh, you know this is hurting citizens, and aren't we supposed to be supporting citizens?" So 
What do you think about the current state of immigration? Do you think this is, um, it is a valid fear to be afraid that mass immigration, illegal or illegal, is going to depress wages, you know, ruin our health care, reduce the quality it's of our It's funny school? you should ask because I was, I read a story on that not about a couple of years ago. And what it boiled, what the concise, the consensus of this report or study was is that the middle class sees the emergency rooms full. They see the anchor babies. They see all of these pressures on the infrastructure, and they're stuck with a bill. Well, apparently, and this is according to the study, corporations used to pay 70 to 80 percent of that bill in the communities, but those corporations have gone overseas. And so now they long, no longer pay for these things through their tax rates, and they're doing business. So the burden was all of a sudden dropped on the middle class. The middle class looked around for somebody to blame and goes, oh, it's the Mexicans in the, in the like I did. Oh, it's the Mexicans in the emergency room. They've infuriated me. Mm -hmm. But in reality, it's the corporations and our, our capitalist system that was able to allow these guys to have tax loopholes and go overseas. At least that's the report I read. Okay. So you would be in favor then of something where, you know, an economic policy, trade deals, whatever, that is, provides disincentives for American business to be going overseas. Yeah, I guess so. Okay. I'm not a, very good at economics. Yeah. I'm an artist. Okay. We're terrible. But I would say <laughs> that if that's true, what that study said, and it probably is, then there's something to look at there and correct. And it, it, it just kept point, keep pointing if, if the immigrants may not be doing it a service. You might be hiding the truth. What do you think? I, what do you mean? I'm sorry. I don't, I don't understand. If the anger of the middle class is focused on them being stuck with the bill for this lousy infrastructure, and they're kind of pointed to the obvious in their face, the immigrants in the emergency room, mm -hmm. when in reality, it's the corporate shuffling that has taken those infrastructure funds and put them overseas, would it do us any good to keep pointing at the immigrant? Or should we look at the real reason, if no, that's a real reason? You're absolutely right. And which would be great because I think it would be a big relief for us to stop blaming these people who are being treated like laboratory rats. I mean, <laughs> if you were, you know, if you were, if you were, I know. if you were a, a, a conscientious guy in Mexico with a family and you're next to another guy who's not so conscientious and he says, Hey, I don't know about you. I'm hightailing it to, you know, to Yuma when we're picking stuff. You see the guy is sending money home in remittances. Right. Kids are getting, you know, their teeth are getting fixed. They're living in a better house. How would you not come, especially when it's our policy, not to punish the guy that came over? That's right. Or punish the guy that hires the guy that came over. Yeah, I know. It's this ridiculous system. So, no, I would wholeheart, yeah, I agree 100%. If we could start pointing at where the real levers are being pushed, that would be a huge step forward. Oh, great. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. I'm sorry, I've editorialized so much at the end. The, <laughs> the big finish should be you, not me. So ends this interview in our Drive to Understand series. That was Van Kraft in Ashland, Oregon, who I can't thank enough for his honest opinions on the things that we Americans need to be talking to each other about. I hope you consider supporting this series by liking the video and subscribing to the channel. Thanks.